Hey all, Pete here. I'm just sitting down to do my third video on guns. And so far, I've had pretty good feedback on the first two that I've done. I certainly did have some, uh, I wouldn't call it hostile, but maybe slightly aggressive feedback uh, from some folks, which I expected. I mean, people... People are going to disagree on this issue. It's a it's a contentious issue at times. Um, see my dog in the background photobombing the video. That's Maggie Joe. Um, uh, and so I expect some you know tense feedback at times, but but more often than not, so far the feedback has been really good. So this is video number three. This is going to be more about uh, gun culture and. Um, and and my story a little bit uh, but before we get into that real quickly i want to review some main points from my first two videos and also remind you all that the purpose of these videos is not to persuade anybody to uh my way of thinking it's simply to educate and maybe provide um an alternate perspective than what maybe you have considered in the past um and increase uh, education that will hopefully have the ripple effect of producing more productive dialogue between gun people and non-gun people, if that makes sense, okay? I know there's those are just two labels, and labeling is dangerous, but, uh, there, but that, that's the best way I could say it. So, just to review, in my first couple of videos, we talked about a lot of terminology and about guns and how they work. And so most guns, whether handgun or rifle type type weapon, long a long gun is what they're called, um, fall into one of two categories: they're either semi-automatic, which means that the trig the the firearm will shoot every time you pull the trigger, and those are normally magazine-fed um, firearms. So there's usually an internal or external magazine that that connects to the firearm holding the ammunition, and every time that you pull the trigger, it shoots and, and extracts that round automatically. Usually, it's, they're usually gas-operated, extracts, extracts the round, the bolt feeds another round into the chamber, and it will fire when you pull the trigger again. Those are semi-automatic firearms, pistols and rifles. They also make semi-automatic shotguns, okay? Uh, the other the other category are, are guns that are not semi-auto, so they require some form of manual extracting of the round and feeding of a new round, or in some manual form of cocking the firearm in order to fire again. So with revolvers, remember we looked at single action revolvers and double action revolvers. Uh, single action revolvers you have to cock every time. Double action revolvers they'll shoot every time you pull the trigger, so they're semi-automatic. But they're not fed by a magazine. Okay, so there would be one exception to that, right? We also looked at a lever action rifle. That's like the old style cowboy gun. You have to cock it each time. The bolt action rifle that's that's fed by a bolt. You have to cock the bolt each time. Um, they also make uh, something called pump action. So you see the shotguns where they're like, ch -ch -ch, boom, right? That's a pump. That's called pump action because you pump. And as you bring it down, it extracts the shell. And as you as you slide the it, the pump action back forward, it it feeds another shell. So they make pump action shotguns and rifles. You don't see very many pump action rifles anymore, but they actually there there are some out there. And so you've got two camps of firearms, generally speaking. You've got semi-auto, which means you it fires every time you pull the trigger. Generally, those are fed by some form of a magazine. And you've got the others that require the, the shooter to do something in between each round. Now, I have some people have asked me, what about fully automatic weapons? Okay, well, fully automatic weapons are when you pull the trigger and it will shoot every round in there until you release the trigger. So that would be like a machine gun. Okay. Uh, fully automatic weapons are in no way, shape, or form readily available to the general public. Um, and so there's already, it's, it's already extremely difficult for somebody to get their hands on a fully automatic weapon. 
Um, I'm not going to say they're completely unavailable to the general public, but uh, but the, but but they're you know short of somebody modifying something to make it fully auto or something like that. They're 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 just not generally owned by the general public. So I'm not talking about fully automatic weapons in these videos. Okay, all right. So we talked about the different types and function how guns function. We talked about the different parts of a cartridge. So remember, this is the brass or the casing. This is the projectile or the bullet. The back, that little thing on the back is the primer. The firing pin strikes the primer, ignites the powder inside the casing, which then propels the projectile out of the firearm. This part's the bullet. So we refer to this as a cartridge or a round or ammo. We don't refer to this as a bullet. The bullet is just the thing on the front, okay? We talked about different calibers of firearms. And remember, this is one of those important words to remember when you're reading news stories and stuff, because a lot of people use firearm terminology and they do not understand what they're talking about. They're just using words they've heard other people use. And it's important to be specific, especially if you want gun people like me to listen to you. Okay. And so remember, a caliber just means the size of the bullet. That's all that the caliber means. So if we're talking about a 223 caliber, there's a that the, this bullet right here, that's this is a 223 cartridge. So the when we say 223, we're talking about the size of this. It's a 22 caliber bullet, right? Funny enough, 22 long rifle. These bullets are about the same size. They're both 22 caliber bullets, as you can see. Okay. Or we're talking about a 308 or whatever we're talking about, caliber is just the size of the bullet. It's the measurement of the bullet, okay? Velocity is how fast the bullet travels, okay? Velocity is how fast the bullet travels. And then we talked about different kinds of bullets themselves. So you could have a 308 caliber, but there are a lot of different kinds of bullets that could be in the ammo. So you could have full metal jacket bullets, which are generally no to low expansion once they hit a target, all the way to hollow points that have rapid expansion when they hit a target. Um, soft points turn into kind of a mushroom when they enter flesh. Um, I talked a lot about the VMAX round, which is what this is. And it, it has extremely rapid expansion when it hits a target. It penetrates about that far and then rapidly expands to do the maximum amount of damage, okay? And so why do I talk about different kinds of bullets? Because bullet type and velocity has far more to do with damage when we're talking about guns that are regularly available and widely distributed than the caliber, okay? Um, and so when people use words like high caliber, that doesn't really mean anything. It just means it's a larger caliber. Remember it? The the high the the higher the caliber or I mean two twenty three is not a high caliber gun or a high caliber you know it but it gets called that for some reason in the media and it's not true like two twenty three is a small caliber very small caliber it's, it's okay a three oh eight would be a larger caliber and then if you get up into things like a forty or fifty caliber bullet which you know then we're getting a bit like the forty four magnum is a is a bigger caliber it's a larger bullet than than a 30 caliber bullet right so so but but caliber doesn't caliber is just the size of the bullet so so what i like i said in one of my videos it's important to remember when we're talking about bullet damage speed the velocity matters a lot and so does the type of bullet okay the 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 v max bullet is going to do a lot more damage generally speaking than a full metal jacket bullet Okay, why do I why do I hammer this point so hard? Because a lot of people are getting into uh, debates about guns based on what kind of damage can be done by a particular kind of firearm. And folks, I don't think that's a good place to focus our concentration or our dialogue because any gun will kill you dead. And any gun is an assault weapon. And bullets are designed to do damage. Okay, that's why we shoot them. So I use a VMAX round because of the maximum amount of damage it does to the insides of a coyote to kill it instantly. 223, the 22 caliber bullet, 
the 223, 220 Swift, 22, 250. They're the most popular, widely distributed uh, varmint rounds, varmint calibers for rifles in the nation. Okay. And so, uh, yes, bullets do a lot of damage. And, and any bullet can, has the potential to do significant damage when fired at a human being. And so I think trying to argue about how much damage a bullet does in, um, you know, in things like uh, gelatin or things like that to, to try to make a case for, for or against any particular firearm, I don't think that's the place to focus because guns are designed to do damage. That's what they do. And I'm not going to pretend that's not what they do. Okay, that's what guns do. They kill. That's what they're designed to do. When they're in the hands of a person and you shoot it at, at, at something, you, you, you're you shooting to kill. One of the four rules for firearm safety is don't point your gun at anything you don't want to destroy. Okay, there are basic firearm safety rules that we learn at a very young age, and that's one of them. You don't point your gun at anything you don't want to destroy. Okay, and so I think it's more important to talk about uh, if we're going to talk about policy and things like that, to focus on other areas, okay? Um, so, anyway, we talked about bullet type, we talked about velocity, and we talked about caliber. And so, a small caliber, like a 223 can have a higher velocity than a large caliber. The bullet can travel faster, okay? So, a 220 Swift can travel up to about 4,600 feet per second. I don't... I, I, I don't think I've ever heard of a 308 round being low that could be loaded to travel that fast. Okay. And so it matters. Also, we have to be careful when we categorize different firearms because if we say military type firearms, that doesn't really that doesn't say anything. And so it's important to remember that that some calibers like the 223 or a 22 caliber rifle is very popular with civilians, but it also has a military application, um, you know, as well. And so you have to be more specific when you're talking about what kind of firearms you have concerns about. All right. All right. With that said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, and then I'm going to finish up with, with why people like me uh, feel like we need guns. Okay. Uh, in, in general. All right. So, I grew up in Idaho. I grew up in a very small town in Idaho. Um, uh, I think less than 2,000 people when I was growing up. I went to the same school, kindergarten through 12th grade, and my graduating class had 63 people in it. Um, since my very earliest memories, I remember guns. Guns have been a part of everything growing up. Um, my, my grandfather uh, hunted... His grandfather was a hunter and a sheep herder. My family on my dad's side was Basque. Uh, if you don't know who the Basque people are, you can look them up. But they settled uh, in the United States in the in the late 1800s. Um, and so guns have been around me my entire life. I've never been afraid of guns. I, I was never taught to be afraid of guns. I was taught to respect guns and to understand that guns are a, a tool that in the right hands is safe and in the wrong hands is very dangerous. Okay. Um, and so I was taught to respect guns. I was taught the rules of firearm safety from a very young age and was often asked to repeat them uh, in the years after I got my hunting license. Off, every time we'd go hunting and my dad would hand me the rifle, he'd go, what are the rules? And I'd say, finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire. Treat every gun as if it's loaded. Always be aware of your target and what's behind it. And don't point your gun at anything that you don't wish to destroy. I mean, I had to repeat that all the time. Okay. I took hunter safety in an elementary school. Okay. My dad and one of his friends taught it. There were about 25 of us in the class. I was 11 years old. We were in an elementary school. In the front of the class was a table covered with guns. Um, it was not weird to see a gun in a school. Uh, from... My earliest years, I remember with my friend who grew up on a farm, even seven, eight, nine years old, we had BB guns, we'd take them, we'd go out for the whole day, shooting sparrows, shooting tin cans, you know, whatever. Um, when I was 12 and got my hunting license, then the BB guns became 22s, you know, we'd be out all day with our 22s, shooting ground squirrels, uh, plinking, you know, whatever. Uh, we didn't have to even... Uh, you know, I mean, there was no third degree if we if we asked mom and dad, hey, I'm going to take my 22 and go shoot with 
my friend. Okay, remember the rules. You know, I mean, there was no, are you sure? I don't know if it's safe. You know, um, we were taught all about guns from a very, very young age. Um, and you would have been hard pressed to find anybody or very many people in our town who, if, if even if they didn't own a firearm, uh, didn't know, didn't know how to shoot or who didn't hunt or something like that, because everybody knew about guns in high school. It wasn't uncommon to have your shotgun, you know, in your car, your vehicle, so that after football practice, we could run out and shoot some pheasants or something like that. You know, it was very, guns were very just around and they still are in Idaho. Guns are very popular in Idaho. Um, and, and a lot of people own guns. Uh, I left high school early. Uh, I was 17. I went into the Marine Corps and, uh, you know, I was in the infantry. So once, I mean, from starting in boot camp, at, so when I was 17, we were entrusted with an M16 A2 rifle. Um, and then I was in the infantry, you know, slept with that rifle, <laughs> ate with it, carried it everywhere, could do just about anything that I needed to do with that rifle in one hand. Um, and, you know, I got out of the Marine Corps, thought I wanted to be a bodyguard for a brief period of time, uh, went to an accredited school that teaches you how to uh, teaches executive protection. All the instructors are, are former law enforcement, uh, former secret service, um, you know, or had been in the executive protection protection industry for decades. Um, and while there learned all kinds of new stuff about firearms beyond what I was taught in, in the Marine Corps. Um, you know, I, I've been around guns, guns, guns don't scare me in and of themselves. Um, uh, but, but I, but I freely admit a gun in the hands of the wrong person is very, very dangerous. Okay. Um, when I was, when I turned 21, I, uh, started working with, with teenagers and youth. And I've spent the last 26 years of my life working with, working with youth, with teenagers. Um, I've worked in youth ministry. I've worked in shelter homes for kids. I've worked in treatment centers, detention centers, private schools, public schools, um, in the last almost five years now, I've worked as a counselor. I went back to school when I was 40 to get my master's degree in social work. So I'm kind of a weird guy. I'm a, I am love guns and I'm a social worker. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in some different worlds sometimes. Um, and so I care very much about kids. And one thing I'll reiterate in my next video as well is don't ever accuse a gun owner of not caring about children. That's a real quick way to end any conversation. I care deeply about children and youth so much so that I have dedicated my life to helping them. And so just, just, if you're going to talk with me about guns, don't accuse me of not caring about the kids. Um, so, um, I've dedicated my life to working with, with mainly with teenagers and young adults. I've been a counselor the last five years, about three fourths of my clients are teenagers. I do a lot of trauma counseling. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and I still hunt and I still shoot, and I still carry guns, and I still carry a concealed weapon um, most of the time, and, uh, and guns are still a huge part of my life. I keep my guns locked in a safe, except for my concealed carry. I understand very much the implications of the, the choice or the decision to use deadly force uh, if I were called upon to do so. I shoot my guns regularly, especially those that I carry for protection. Uh, I shoot them under stress uh, so that I can deal with an adrenal stress response if I'm in that situation. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just, I have a background that's full of firearms, firearms familiarity, firearm uses for different purposes, uh, and, and respect for firearms, okay? But I'm also, you know, a, a, a common common thing I see a lot of times is people saying gun owners are dumb rednecks and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm not, I'm, I have a master's degree <laughs> in social work, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm a published author. I've written four books. Um, you know, uh, and so, and I work with kids and I care about kids. So I, you know, be careful, right? Because, because when, when some people say things like, you know, people aren't responsible enough to have guns or nobody should have a gun or things like that, or people aren't smart enough to have guns. Like, 
knowing what you know about me, do you really think I'm a person that's not safe to own a gun? Right? I mean, think about that. You know, be careful with absolutes and be careful with hasty generalizations. Because a lot of times, I mean, there's going to be an exception. And if there's an exception, then it's not an absolute. So you got to be careful. Okay? So that's a little bit about that's a little bit about me and who I am. What do I generally use guns for now? Hunting and trapping is mostly what I use guns for now. Is hunting and trapping. I carry carry a my 22 with me on my hip uh, when I'm checking my coyote traps and stuff. And then when I'm hunting, if I'm bow hunting, then a lot oftentimes if I'm in bear country or lion country, I'll carry my 44 mag on my hip just in case I need it and. Uh, and then if I'm rifle hunting or whatever, obviously I don't, but then I'm carrying a rifle, um, you know, for hunting deer, or elk, or things like that. A couple weeks ago, I shot a bear with my old, my old right, one of my old rifles. So um, I own, you know, a handful of guns. I don't own as many as some people own, but I own more than others. Um, so I don't know if I'd be considered a gun nut. I mean, I don't have a vast collection, um, but you know, that's just a little bit about me. Um, and so keep in mind, you know, why do I tell you about me? Well, again, because when you're, when you're having gun conversations, be careful not to label people. Okay. Be careful not to assume things about people. All right. Uh, that can be, that, that's, that's going to hurt your efforts in productive dialogue. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to address one more thing in this video. Um, and, and this is going to be the start of where things might get a little tense. I'm going to stay, I'm going to be very respectful. Okay. I'm going to be very respectful. And again, I'm just presenting the gun owner's side here and trying to provide some education. You don't have to agree with me, but I, I but I'm also not going to say something or water something down to try to make it more palatable because that doesn't help you understand the position of gun owners. Okay. So here we go. The question I want to address today is why does somebody need an AR-15 or an AK-47 or a Mini-14 or a 1022 or any one of the handful of semi-automatic magazine-fed um, rifles that that can accommodate high-capacity magazines? Um you know, so I don't want to limit it just to AK-47s or AR-15s because there are other rifles that will do that. M1A, uh, the Mini-14, the 1022. There are other rifles, okay, than just the AK and the AR, all right? So why do you need that gun? You know, I get I get asked that even by friends. Well, why do you need that gun? Why do you need that gun? Well, why does anybody need a gun? You know, these these responses would work for even why does anybody need a gun? So I'm going to give you the reasons why us gun owners need guns these are what these are what we're going to tell you okay at least the res us respectful gun owners some people say because i have a right to and shut up but that's not what i do so all right first of all recreation okay guns are fun to shoot okay especially semi-auto guns they're a lot of fun because you can throw a magazine in that's got a bunch of rounds in it you don't have to reload and you can go out plinking target shooting um I don't co shoot competitively, but some of my friends do, and those 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 competitive matches with the semi-auto rifles are just look like a ton of fun, um, you know. And um, and so you know, people own guns, and people can own an AR or an AK for recreation. They are an extremely popular sport rifle uh, because of their ability to have a high capacity magazine that you don't have to reload. You can shoot them fast. And, um, and they're a lot of fun to shoot. They're just fun. I've taken people out who have never shot a gun before and they kind of have fun. And then when they get to shoot some a semi-auto, they love it. It's, they, there's, this, is a, this is a lot of fun to do. And so one reason why I, why me or another gun owner would own an AR or an AK-47 or a M1A or a Mini-14 or any of those other semi-auto rifles is they're fun. They're fun to shoot for recreation, for sport, okay? Second reason, uh, for survival, okay, for survival, there, the, the AK, I said in one of my videos, I think the AK-47 is the ideal survival rifle, okay, you can hunt with it, it's a 30 caliber bullet, so it's a big enough bullet to hunt big game, all right, 
and you can protect yourself with it, okay, against one or more persons, okay, so in a, in a very dangerous negative situation, a society continues to deteriorate, we end up in, you know, a situation where the, the government falls or something like that, I mean, is it likely? I don't know, but just I'm just saying for preparatory and survival purposes, a rifle like an AK-47 is the perfect fit. You can hunt with it. It's It requires very little cleaning and maintenance. Um, and so it's a great survival gun. It can fire in all conditions, under all temperatures, and, and it'll even fire underwater. I mean, it's just an amazing, amazing rifle in that sense. Okay. And so it's, it, you can hunt with it. You can serve it's again, it's a good survival gun. So there's another reason why someone would own an AK or an AR. All right. Another reason for defense of home, um, AKs, ARs, mini 14s, they're not the ideal self-defense weapon for your home, but they're not bad. Um, again, you have, you have the capacity to hold a lot of rounds. It doesn't require a lot of reloading. They're short. So instead of like a shotgun that's long that someone could get a hold of and you'd be end up wrestling over it, you can keep an, an AK or an AR pinched under your arm and it's it's going to project not as far out. It's a shorter, it's a shorter weapon. Um, so you have more control of it, over it close to your body in defense of your home. Uh, they're not a bad, they're not a bad way to go. I think a shotgun is a little better for that purpose, honestly, uh, but but they're not a bad way to go. So for defense of my home, I, I, I'm, I might or other gun owners might own an AR or an AK or a Mini 14 or something like that. All right. For defense against enemies, foreign. Okay. Are we really so prideful in the United States that we think we could never be invaded by a foreign power? Has it ever happened? No. Could it? Absolutely. So I might carry, I might own an AK or an AR for defense of my country and home against enemies foreign. And keep in mind what's going on in Ukraine right now. You look at the pictures from over there, the civilians are fighting against a foreign invader using personally owned firearms. Okay, and I'm sorry, but a three round deer gun is not going to do as good of a job against foreign invaders as an AK or an AR or a Mini-14 or something like that's going to do, all right? It's like taking a squirt gun to a, uh, you know, to a, to a real gunfight. I mean, it, it, and so, you know, part of the, part of what gun owners believe about the Second Amendment is it's to protect, that the civilians can act as a protective force against a, a foreign power that's invading, Okay. And, and we all know if we study history that countries where the civilians own firearms are less likely to be invaded. That's why places like Israel and Switzerland and places like that require military service and you have to own a firearm and you know, you're there to protect if you have to. And so we have a very large non-official military in this country that could respond if we were invaded by a foreign power. Okay, so again, is it likely? I don't know. Probably not, but... Again, pride comes before a fall. Are we really so arrogant that we think it could never happen to us? And so one of the reasons why gun owners like to own ARs and AKs and Mini-14s and M1As is because they could use it to protect the country from a foreign invader. And finally, for protection against enemies, domestic. Domestic terrorism is now a thing. It's in the news. It's happening. And also... Again, is it likely? I don't know. But if our own government were ever to decide to turn on us in some way, then an armed populace helps prevent that. And I know that that sounds a little bit conspiracy theorist, you know, but, uh, but think about it. You know, military, government, police, they're all made up of people just like you and me. And there are good people and there are bad people. And we have seen the kinds of atrocities that militaries have committed. I mean, militaries that, with war crimes, using rape as a weapon of war and genocide, um, you know, dishonest and crooked elected leaders and law enforcement at times, not dissing on law enforcement. I have a lot of friends in law enforcement, but we know not all cops are good cops. We know not all government leaders are good government leaders. We know not all military people are good. And those kinds of forces and those kinds of powers with the kind of equipment 
that they have and the kinds of resources they have, if they were ever decided they were going to start, you know, turning on the citizens, would, would all of us with our, you know, non-military type guns be able to stop them? Probably not, but it might make a little bit of a difference. You never know. And so gun owners like myself say, you know, I hope it never happens. It probably won't, but my AK or my AR or my Mini 14 is the gun that I keep in the back of my safe in case. Okay? In case. Now, does everybody need to do that? No. I understand not everybody would be the person to stand up and fight, but some people need to be able to do that. Okay? Some people need to be able to do that. It's just a reality of, of the existence of evil in the world. That there are bad guys out there. And some of those bad guys are in political office. And some of those bad guys are in the military. And some of those bad guys are cops. You know, and so there needs to be good guys and good gals too. To, to stand up against them. Okay? So that would be the last reason. Now... Whether or not you agree with my reasons, it's, it's up to you. Again, I'm not trying to change your mind. I just want you to understand where gun owners are coming from on these things. Okay? So, again, not trying to persuade, just trying to educate. Hopefully, you understand a little bit more inside the mind of somebody like me uh, about why we own the guns we do. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to comment. Even if you disagree, just be respectful. Okay, I'll be respectful in return. If you can't be respectful, resist the urge to comment. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll be doing uh, one or two more of these. I think two more total. Thanks again for watching. Feel free to share this with your friends. Be good to each other out there. We'll see you in the next video.